And God, I pray that right now as we continue, Lord, uh, this having this moment with you, Lord, that we would worship you with, with our minds and with our hearts being knit together as we consider the truth of your word here, God, and, um, and the treasure that you have for us here tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. All right. Well, hey, guys, God bless you. And tonight we're going to be in 1 Samuel in chapter number 19. All right. Just trucking right along. And um, and we're also going to be celebrating communion. You see, I have my little communion cup right here. And again, um, if you don't feel like you can't have communion, maybe because you don't have like all the the elements or, or the like the cracker or, or the juice, you know, just do what you can. Right. Be creative you know, be innovative. And it's not really so much what it is as what we're doing is we're using these elements to remember what Jesus did for us. Okay. They're on the cross. And so you've heard me share, like if you, if your kids have those little goldfish, those will work too, right? A little saltine cracker or a piece of bread, you know, um, tortilla, whatever. Okay. Um, but we want to celebrate what Jesus did. That's for sure. All right. So, Hey guys. And also too, I want to let you know, stay tuned after our time of, of worshiping the Lord in the study of his word and song and communion, we're going to have a couple of announcements. One of which I'm pretty excited to share. Our men are going to be getting together on this Saturday. So I'll let you know more about that. All right. So stay tuned. All right, guys. So let's open up our Bibles here tonight to first Samuel and chapter Number 19 is where we're going to be at. And um, guys, uh, you know, the last time that we were together, we were we were looking at uh, the, you know, just Saul and, and his and his jealousy that he had for David. Remember, we were kind of just taking a transition now and looking at David you know, and, and Jonathan and all those relationships as we're going to continue in that. And also Saul is a big part of it still, um, you know, here in this story, this narrative that we're going through. And the last time that we were together, we were looking at really with Saul, this jealousy that, that he began to have. And we were talking about how powerful, uh, like a, a jealous heart or a jealous life can can be in a person's life. And we've seen this in the life of Saul. Remember David, uh, in the last chapter, chapter number 18, David was very successful. And, um, you know, and we talked about how obedience, you know, brings success, right? And so he was successful and uh, he was getting the accolades. He was getting the attention, especially, you know, because the women would come out and they were actually saying, hey, Saul would kill his thousands but David killed his tens of thousands, right? So he was being recognized in song by all the women. And this really brought this jealous heart, this jealous attitude uh, in Saul. And, and we remember last time he tried to kill David. Remember twice he tried to kill him and, and David escaped, right? And we were looking at how jealousy in relationships is from the devil, and, and this is something that many of us, you know, maybe some more than others have dealt with and have wrestled with. And it, it is something that's, it's a real emotion. It's something that, you know, that maybe we, some of us have a little bit more of a weakness than others in that. But I, I think it's, it's safe to say that we need to understand that jealousy is from the devil. As a matter of fact, you know, when we look in the Bibles or in the Bible uh, and about Satan, about Lucifer, you know, he was really jealous and, you know, and he was, you know, filled with pride. That jealousy made him prideful and he put, he was saying, hey, I should be worshipped. I should, you know, get all these accolades rather than God, right? And pride was found in his heart. And, you, well, we know the story that, that, that the devil was cast out of heaven there and, and the devil brought a third of the angels with him. And so jealousy is from the devil and it does damage this jealousy that, that, you know, we can have, um, oftentimes, you know, it does damage and it really, really this jealousy that we have at times, not all the time, but at times it really, it stems from insecurities that we all have, you know, and with those insecure, I have insecurities guys, you know, I do, we all have insecurities one way or another. And, but what we do with our insecurities is we, we surrender them to the Lord and I think one of the best things that we can do with the insecurities that we have about our own selves 
is to make ourselves vulnerable also, right? With people that we love and people that we know that love us as well, that's going to pray for us, that's going to give to us, you know, godly wisdom and instruction from the word and, you know, not going to use it against us. But I think those are some healthy things that we can do. All right, so, but chapter 19, guys, as we continue in this, we're going to see how God is bigger than jealousies, right? We're going to see how God is bigger than jealousies, and we're going to continue to see this, this jealous attitude kind of be aroused in Saul, who is still king of Israel at the time. So let's take a look here, chapter 19, and we're going to start at verse number one, and this is what it says. And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. Or some of your translations might say that he loved David or he was very fond of David. Uh, it's the same word that was used in the previous chapter, in chapter 18, uh, talking about how, how Jonathan loved David, right? And so um, it says here that Saul's son delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, uh, told David, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in, uh, in the mountains. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king sin against the servant, his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine, and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then would you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? Verse six, and Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David and Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was in his presence as before. And so remember, David was brought into the king's presence a few chapters ago when he was a lot younger to play a, to play an instrument, the lyre, like a guitar, right? Because he would bring peace. John, uh, king Saul was already losing his mind and the spirit of the Lord had already, you know, the hand of God has already been lifted off of Saul. And so he was going through these ra fits of rage and everything. And so, but the only thing that kind of calmed him down was the music that David would play. And so here he is, we see that David's back into this. But let's take a look at this real quick, these first seven verses. You know, I, I look at these first seven verses and I think of how godly friendships are greater than jealousies, right? Godly friendships are greater than, uh, than jealousies. The first thing that we see is the jealous, uh, obsessive hatred from Saul, okay? First thing. Now, notice it says that... Um, that and Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, to all his servants that they should kill David. Like, let's just go out and kill him, right? This is the motive, right? And, and we see here Jonathan's response, right? He is like, hey, he's got this voice of reason. But Saul, again, guys, check it out. He's, he's really just like infected. <laughs> he's infected with this jealousy and this jealous, this obsessed obsessive jealousy has uh, has birthed into hatred right and he just wants to kill david at, at any cost right and now he's trying to get jonathan and all of the servants there you know uh, to be on his side it's as if saul has lost all sense of reality and you know that's what sin will do even jealousy jealousy is a sin right? And, and so sin will do that. Sin in our lives, unconfessed sin, willful sin, when a person is just so given into it, that person is going to lose all sense of reality of what's going on. They're not going to observe that they have a problem or there's an issue going on in their life. It's going to be reflected. It's going to be excused. There's always going to be some excuse and it's never going to be them. It's always going to be other people. You know how I know that? That was me. <laughs> that was me for many years of my life and, and willful sin. It was never me. It was always someone else's fault, right? And I, you know how we think even when we're in sin, we think that, oh, the only person that I'm really hurting is myself, so leave me alone. Stay out of my business, 
right? And see, and again, it's just when, when there's willful sin, it's just really, it does a number on the, on the person's mind, right? Where, where you lose all sense of, of reason, you lose all sense of really of reality, really, you know, and, and a person goes cuckoo, a person goes crazy, as we see right here in, in, in this narrative, in this story with, with King Saul, right? He's like, he's out of his mind, right? And that's why I love when we come to Jesus, when a person comes and they confess their, their sin before the Lord, you know, the Bible tells us that there's a renewing of the mind, a washing of the mind, right? And, and I, that's happened to me, and I hope and pray that it's happened to you. I trust it has, where you have like that aha moment, you know, it's like, oh, Lord, what have I, what was I doing? What was I thinking? Why was I doing that? You know, it's, and some of the stuff, man, that goes through my mind of how I used to live, it's embarrassing, I, I will never even share it because it's embarrassing, man. It's like, I cannot believe I was thinking like that. But again, you lose all sense of reality. And we see this here being, being uh, just being exhibited through Saul, who's king of Israel right now. He just wants to kill and murder, really, uh, King David. But I love here as we see, you know, at the end of verse number one, into chapter, uh, into verse number four, we see this godly friendship that Jonathan has. And I, I love it because a godly friendship is going to protect. It really is. A godly friendship is going to protect. And this is what we see here. Because um, Jonathan, he, he, what he does, we see this, um, he goes, you know, it's, obviously we're told that he loves him, but he goes right over to, to David, Jonathan does. And he's like, hey, Dave, you know, I don't know if he called him Dave, but he's like, hey, Dave, you know, um, hey, my dad wants to kill you, dude. You know, so lay low, you know, be trucha. You ever hear that word? You know, watch out, watch your back. Right. And so here, Jonathan, this is again, this is a godly friendship. And we see this. He's going to protect. You know, love is going to look out, guys. Listen, love is going to look out for a brother or a sister. Right. Genuine, authentic love is going to look out for a brother. Listen to what it says in First John in chapter number four, verse number 20. If you would, please write this down in your Bible. OK, write it down. First John, chapter four, verse 20 says this. If someone says, I love God, but hates, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people, we can see how can we love God whom we cannot see, right? And so it's just having this authentic love for another person, you know, and that kind of a love you know, authentic, genuine, godly love, a love that's going to protect, a love that's going to, you know, even, you know, um, you know, faithful are the wounds of a brother. You ever hear that verse? It's in the book of Proverbs. And, and you know, even a, a faithful, loving brother or sister is going to be willing to make themselves vulnerable and say, hey, listen, there's some things that need to change. You know, faithful are those wounds. And that's coming from somebody who, who loves another person. You know, and we see this is the kind of relationship here that David has with Jonathan and Jonathan has with David. Remember back in chapter number 18, they made a covenant, right? They, they made this, 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 um, this um, con, like kind of a contract, you know, they, of their mutual love for one another. And so we see this being uh, dis demonstrated. And so their relationship and love for each other, guys, it stems from their shared commitment to God and to the future of God's people. That's where their friendship comes from. They, they, they have all these things in common. We talked about last time their personality and, and kind of just the way that they are. But it's really more, I, I believe it's more of their, their mutual, mutual interest and shared interest and passion that they have for God and for God's people. You know, they want to just move forward, okay? And, you know, they, they have this, this passion also for the future of God's people, not to mention, you know, their attitudes again, okay? So that their, their, their um, uh, personalities that they have with each other. So we see here that Jonathan's response here as he hears from you know his father that wanted to do this what he responds or how he what he does is he he reveals practical wisdom in his heart right and his, and he what he wants to do is he wants to go and serve 
And so he, he uses this practical wisdom and he goes to his dad. You know, first of all, he goes to, you know, David, right? But then he goes back over to Saul, who is his dad, who, who is serving as king. And he reminds him of all the things that David has done. Are you sure you want to do this, dad? Are you sure you want to, you know, um, go there and, and just destroy you know, David and, and all this, you know, because after all, he this he has done some really good things, right? And so because of this godly wisdom, Saul was able to reason and he swore an oath, okay? He was able to reason and he swore an oath. No, notice it says right there in verse number seven, actually, of this chapter, and Jonathan called David, um, I'll see, let me see, uh, I'm sorry, verse number six, it says, and Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan and Saul swore, watch this, he says, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. Now, just remember that as we get closer to the end of this chapter, we're going to see how this kind of all turns out. And so um, now because of, again, this is all godly wisdom, and he was able to bring Saul to this place of reason, okay? And he swore an oath. Um, now, the reasoning here that Saul was having because of Jonathan allowed David to return back into the palace, to return back to what he was doing. You know, and I was just thinking of this earlier, you know, I was like, man, I wonder what was going through David's mind right now. You know, David was a man after God's own heart, okay? And he he loved the Lord. And he, already this is the third time, you know, that he's hearing this, that, you know, this attempt you know, um, to have his life being taken from King Saul. And now he, he's just probably like, man, I don't know if I can trust this dude or what, but he's just, again, we see he's trusting the Lord and he's trusting the friendship that, that he has between Jonathan as well. Okay, so let's pick it up here, uh, chapter 19, verse eight now. It says this, and there was a war again. Now watch this. Okay, so things seem to be okay, right? Like, okay, we're, 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 Everything's all good. David's back in the palace. Jonathan was able to reason with his dad and all that stuff. You know what? Another thing too, about, real quick about that, guys. I was thinking about this. You know, just Jonathan and the ability for him to just have the, the practical godly wisdom to navigate through this issue, through this thing, right? It's not like Jonathan was like, you know what? Dad, I am, he didn't say, he didn't do this. He didn't say, dad, I disagree with you, but you know, I'm just going to leave it in God's hands. No, he didn't do that. He did what was right, right? He, he, he said, hey, dad, that is not good, right? And he goes and he tells, he goes and he com communicates this to David, right? And, and guys, I want to just see real quick. I want to say this to, to all of us here is that, you know, we have to remember that there's going to be times when you feel like, you know what, I just better stay out of it. I, I, it's none of my business. You might, and maybe you've encountered something like that. Hey, it's none of my business and I just need to stay out of it. No, let me tell you something. If you are aware of something that is not right, that is not good, that is not honoring to the Lord, you and I, we have a responsibility as a Christian, okay, to do what's right and to say, hey, no, that's not good, okay? No, that's not right. And then we have a, I really do believe this, we have a responsibility to communicate, right? And not just have this indifference kind of an attitude, right? People, Christians who have an indifference kind of an attitude, uh, that basically what they're saying is they're going to allow evil to succeed. You know, can you imagine if Jonathan said, dad, I'm not going to, I'm just going to stay out of it. It's none of my business. I'm going to leave it in the hands of God, you know, and he had the opportunity to warn David, but he didn't. And then Saul actually ambushed and, and killed David, you know, he, obviously, you know, that, that wouldn't be good, right? Well, we believe that God would have interceded, but God interceded through Jonathan, okay? And that's the thing. God chooses to use us as people to intercede. Now, let's, look, let's get back here now. Verse 8, verse 8. And there was a war again, okay? So here, another war. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow so that they fled before him. Then a harm, watch this, then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand and David was playing the lyre. 
And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he eluded Saul, and so that he struck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Check it out. So here we go again. You know, a great there's a war, right? David goes out, and just as as before, you know, David is successful. David is victorious, right? And Saul now, remember, Jonathan was able to speak some, you know, reasoning into his heart. Now Saul is filled with jealousy. Perhaps he's just hearing the singing out of the window. You know, hey, Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands, you know, and Saul is just, you know, just just steaming with this jealousy. Like, who does this guy think he is? He's going to try to take my throne. And all these things begin to race through his mind. And as we've looked at before, this jealousy, it, it, it births hatred, right? And when there's that hatred inside of a person, you know, it, it just, it, it, um, that person is going to lose all sense of reality and, and they're going to lose it. And, David, and Saul, not David, but Saul, he's there and he's sitting, he, you know, what's, he's listening to David play the guitar or the lyre, that instrument, the small little miniature harp kind of a thing. He's listening and all of a sudden, Jonathan just throws, chucks a spear right at David, right, to destroy him, right? And so out of this hatred, he does this, and we see with David, what is, what, what is David? David eludes him, it says, he, he escapes. David escapes, you know, and, and probably, probably the sweat of his brow, probably missed him by that much, you know, who knows? But guys, again, now we know that there's already been two attempts with the spear, you know, remember last chapter and Saul missed him twice. And then in the beginning of this chapter, we, we just read, there was like this, this, um, this threat, I'm going to kill David, but Jonathan was able to, you know, speak reason. And now here it is the third time, the third attempt actually for King Saul to try to kill David and David ends up escaping. You know, I was thinking of this and, and Saul was king, right? Saul was king, and Saul's been in wars. Obviously, we know because there was a song, you know, hey, Saul has killed his thousands. Saul was a big man. It was a big person, right? We're told that he stood head and shoulders above everybody. And I am very certain that Saul was good at what he did. I believe that Saul was good at throwing the spear. I bet you he did not miss much right? Because this was something that he probably practiced and practiced and practiced. And so he was able to handle a spear, this weapon, right? And David escaped death again here this third time. I truly believe it's because of the Lord, because of God. It's going to be, a, a, you know, after this point. So David escapes because I be truly believe the Lord was with him and the Lord, you know, allowed him to escape, Right? And this is going to be the last time that David is actually going to be in the palace until we see later on in, Ch in 2 Samuel, later on in 2 Samuel, okay, until after Saul is dead, okay? And so um, in verse 6, again, we see, you know, going back, okay, verse 6, Saul swears. Remember, we I said, look at that, verse number 6, he takes this oath, he swears, you know, he and he says, I swear an oath as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. It's like, oh, you know, Jonathan, you're so right. You know, again, he had this moment of reasoning, you know, as the Lord lives, David, David's not going to die. David's not going to be killed. I'm not going to do this. And then we see this jealousy begins to, to happen, right? And, and, and he goes out there after him, right? And then in verse 10, we see here, he tries to pin him to the wall. Like like a like a, a what's that pin the tail on the donkey? But this was with a spear, right? Guys, check it out. I, you know, just looking at these couple of verses right here, we see in verse number six, Saul is saying, "As the Lord lives, nothing's going to happen." It's almost as if there was like a moment, right, where, where Saul again has this this. Uh, you know, this, this moment of clarity with the Lord, you know, and it's not going to happen. It's almost as if he's saying, you know what? I, I'm so sorry. I want to get closer to Jesus. I don't want to do this no longer, right? I don't want to try to kill nobody. I don't want to be, have this jealousy no longer. You know, it's all good. Jonathan, you're so right. It's like he went to a, a, a you know, a Bible study and you heard some powerful preaching. And then Saul is like, man, that's so good. And he was like on fire perhaps right? But then a couple days later, there he is, 
you know, sitting in his house, holding on to a spear filled with jealousy. Ain't nothing changed. And he tried to kill him. He tried to kill him. You guys, listen, many people struggle with this. Many people in the church ask for forgiveness, repent of sin, and oh, you know, I, I just want to change, you know, and I repent, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go back, you know, to this kind of a life. Listen, repentance, guys, is revealed in actions. Repentance is revealed in actions. And, and, and unfortunately, right here we see with Saul, it was all talk, right? It was all talk. And, you know, that this is one of the reasons why, you know, when we confess our sin, you know, it's not just a confession, but it's, it's also being, it's going to be demonstrated, you know, in our, in our life. You know, there's a verse that just came to my mind right now, and um, here it is. It's, it's in Psalm 66, okay? Psalm 66, write this in a Bible verse down in your Bible. Psalm 66, verse number 18, and it says this, if I cherish iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not have listened. Yeah, the Lord would not have listened, you know, and here we see in, in the life of, of Saul, he, it's like he, he cherished or he kept this iniquity. It's like he talked about it, but he didn't allow the God, the Holy Spirit to work in his life. He didn't allow God to work in his heart, you know, and he went right back to wanting to kill David. And if this is something that you're struggling with where you say, man, Lord, I just, I don't want to do this no longer. You know, I give it to Jesus and I repent and, you know, you want to turn from it, but then you find yourself, you know, there you, right there again. Let me tell you something. First of all, I would say this, I, you know, if you're truly confessing all of that, I would encourage you what you, what we do now is what you do now as a Christian is that you go to the Lord, you know, and you just ask God to guide you and lead you to a, a small group or to a couple of people that you can pray with and connect with and be open with and transparent with because there's something powerful when we're transparent with other people, you know, and when we're confessing our sin to, to another person. And, you know, it's just like, you know, God, I think in his divine wisdom, it gives us that instruction in the book of uh, James when he writes in his epistle to confess your sin one to another. Right, because now what we're doing is we're, we're, we're opening up to other people, right? And it's not that that person forgives us. It's just that now there's like a sense of, you know, maybe a, we say that accountability, but um, I think it's more than that. You know, it's, it's just, it's just uh, this vulnerability that we're making, that we're giving ourselves. And we see that Saul's not doing any of this, right? And so he may have said one thing, but he did the complete opposite. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 goes on to say, and so Saul, watch this, and so remember his attitude, he's, he's tried to, he tried to spear him, but David got away, right? Now Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him, that he might kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, remember uh, uh, last chapter, okay, David married um, Saul's daughter. So no, this is Saul's daughter. Uh, McCall. So, but McCall, David's wife, told him, if you do not escape with your life tonight, Tomorrow you will be killed. And so here we see uh, Saul's other child, okay, his daughter, uh, who happens to be married to David, is giving him a heads up, just like kind of like Jonathan. Jonathan gave him a heads up. And so she said, hey, my dad's going to kill you if you don't get out of here, right? If you don't escape tonight, you will be killed. So verse 12, so McCall let David down through the window and he fled away and escaped. McCall took an image. Now watch this. I want this, this, let's pay attention to this part. Verse number 13, McCall took an image or your, your translation might say uh, an idol. Okay. I'm reading, as a matter of fact, guys, I just want to let you know, a little uh, side bit right here. I'm reading from the ESV translation. All right. So Michael took an image or McCall took an image and laid it on the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair at its head and covered it with the, with the clothes. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. Then Saul sent the messengers to see David, uh, saying, bring him to me in the bed that I, I may kill him. And when the messengers came in, behold, the image was in the bed with the pillow of goat's hair at its head. Saul said to McCall, why have you deceived me thus and let my enemy go? Notice he's calling David his enemy, right? And you let my enemy go so that he has escaped. And McCall answered Saul, 
He said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? Wait, David didn't say that. That's a lie. You see, so kind of like here McCall, you know, Saul's daughter is kind of in this place of, you know, um, who is she going to be loyal to, right? She's going to be loyal to her husband. She's going to be loyal to her dad. Well, we see that her loyalty right here in the beginning lies with David, you see. And so again, this, this jealousy, what we're going to see right here, guys, what we see in this is that this jealous obsession leads Saul to another plot and to another scheme, right? And guys, this is what jealousy would do. Jealousy, it'll do that. And man, it'll cause you, it'll cause me, it'll cause us to do just crazy things, right? Schemes and plots. And, and when, when there's opportunity, the hatred and rage just to go after somebody, you know? And, and it's, all this happens over time too, guys, right? You know, let's just not think, oh, well, I, I'm, I'm only a little bit jealous. Let me tell you something, that little bit of jealousy grows into a, a great deal and it does destructive. Again, remember, je- I, I'm telling you, jealousy is from the devil, okay? It's a characteristic of the devil. And so here we see all of this, that Saul has been, you know, what he's doing, he's using others. He's been trying to use Jonathan. He's been trying to, you know, use even the military to get David to die, right? He's using others for his own purposes. And he even uses his own children, Jonathan and, and McCall here, his, his daughter, And David's wife, as we see this, his wife comes to the rescue like, you know, hey, Dave, hey, you better go because, man, my dad, he's here. I know how he is. She probably had a lot more insight of how, you know, her Saul was rather than David. And so it's like, hey, you got to get out of here, you know. And what does she do? You know, um, okay, so David escapes out out of the window. But what she does is she gets, you know, this statue. She gets this image. She gets this idol, right? And she puts it in the bed, right? To trick. Okay. And, you know, I was, when I was reading this earlier, maybe you did this when you were 15 or something. I did, you know, uh, when I wanted to leave out the house and everything, you kind of get all the covers and you get the couple of pillows, you put them there, right? And you get a little basketball or something like that, put it at the head of the bed and it's like, put the covers over, right? And because you want to take off for the night and hopefully you'll be back in the morning, you know, before your parents get up or something like that. Um, I don't know. Maybe you did that. Maybe you didn't. That's all good. I hope I'm not, this doesn't give anybody ideas, right? But um, this is, so this is what McCall does. And it actually works, right? It actually works for the men that, that get there and they're like, hey, this is a, you know, this is a dummy, right? Um, that's what they see. Now, this dummy or this image, this idol, guys, this is idol worship. Now, this would be, so and the way that this word is laid out in the original language, okay, which would be Hebrew at this point, is um, basically, it's, it's, a, it's an idol, a part of, you know, um, just like, a, a, you know, you, Oh man, I can't remember. I'm trying to think of the word right now, but you know, you have all the different statues and everything there. And that's what this would be almost kind of like a good luck charm, really. Okay. And, um, so this is, this, that, this kind of idol, you know what this shows us, this reveals to us, okay, that McCall worshiped idols. Okay, that's the bottom line. It reveals to us that McCall worshipped idols. Not, I don't believe at all that this was David, okay? Not at all, because he was a man after God's own heart. And he, he kind of knew better, right? And he just didn't worship. And so this was McCall. And now, I like what um, Charles Ryrie, I like to read a lot of his um, co- little commentaries and stuff. And he says this. He says, lies and idolatry marred the character of McCall. Lies and idolatry marred the character of McCall, of David's wife. And we're going to see in a few chapters down the road um, her, her attitude towards David, right? And she just basically mocks him and disdains him, all these things, right? But we see here again this, this, this lies because she lied. There in verse number 17, she says, hey, well, dad, this is, you know, David told me if I don't do anything, he's going to kill me. That's a lie, right? Um, and, and so this lies mixed in with all this idolatry, you know, it's going to mar anybody's character. It just will. And guys, you know, when we think of character, I want you to just 
pay attention real quick on this thing. I pay attention to the whole thing, but uh, I just have a, a quick word I want to share about, about character. You know, it's the little things, right? It's those little things that really build up a character. It's all the little tiny small things, right? It'll build someone's character up. And it's also equally the little things that'll tear a person's character down. Okay, it's those little things. The little things may seem little, but we all know at the end of the day, they're not little, they're huge, they're foundational, right? Fundamental, if you will, for our own, for our very life at living as a, as a believer, those little tiny things that builds up our character as Christians, as men and women of God. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans chapter five, verses three and five. And again, I would, would encourage you, write these references down if you would. It says this, Paul saying this in Romans chapter five, verse three, he says, not only that, Watch this. He says, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame or in other words, hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, it's those little things and the little things that we go through when we are going through trials or sufferings, right? And as we keep our hearts centered, and right now, guys, wouldn't you say that in some kind of a way that in our life that we're going through some kind of trial, you know, these past several weeks, you know, going 40 plus days already, you know, um, with this kind of quarantine and, you know, uh, the COVID-19 and all this other stuff, you know, it's like as, as um, you know, all of us, we're all going through something, but here's the thing. How are we going through it? How are, how are you enduring it? Are you using these things to just, you know, allow to allow God to produce in you character, endurance. And that endurance, it produces character and character produces hope. And this hope, again, is not a wishful kind of thinking. This hope is a certainty that we can have in the promises of Jesus Christ, in the promises of his word, and the promises of how much he loves us, right? It produces all of that. And man, that's what it's all about, right? It's all about Jesus, it's all about Jesus. So as we go through seasons of life, as we go through challenges, all those little things that may occur in your life, right? All the, you know, the, the you know, just the, the little pitfalls or the circumstances or the challenges or the trials, it's how we deal with them and those small things. It's going to build us up, you see? And it's the little things that we, if we neglect them, it'll tear our character down. And so here, so here's, that's what's going on there with, with David and McCall. So McCall just got done lying about it, right? Now look at verse number 18. This is what it says. And verse 18 goes on to say, now David fled and escaped and he came to Samuel at Ramam. So again, David, we see he, he, he flees and, and he, he gets away, right? Um, again, that's the hand of the Lord upon him. And he came to Samuel at Ramah and told him that Saul had done what Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and lived at uh, uh, Naioth. And it was told Saul, behold, David is at Naioth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, now watch this, check this out. So when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as head over them, the spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul and they also prophesied. And when it also, when, when it also was told to Saul, he sent an, uh, other messengers and they also prophesied. And Saul sent messengers again the third time and they also prophesied. That's the power of God right there, right? Check this out. Then he himself, Saul, then he himself went to Ramah and came to the great well that is in Siku. And he asked, where is Samuel and David, right? He probably had this mean, mean old look on his face. Where is Samuel and David? And one said, behold, they are at Naioth in Ramah. 
and he went there to Nioth and in Ramah, and the Spirit of God came upon him also. And as he went, he prophesied until he came to Nioth in Ramah, and he took and he too stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied before Samuel and lay naked all that day and all that night. Thus it is said, Is Saul among the prophets? Now, remember back in chapter number 10, when Saul, the spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, and remember back then, and, and, and Saul began to prophesy, and the people questioned, is Saul among the prophets? Now, this same, we see the same question here at verse number 24, but this is a little bit of a different kind of a tone. It's more of like, it's like, like almost like questioning, like, well, it is a question, but it's like, is Saul one of the prophets? Like, you know, we don't believe this because dude's wacko. We, 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 we've seen, we've heard, and we understand how he loses it at times. And so we see him here prophesying, though. And so it's more like a, you know, they're, they're really um, just like bewildered, right, with seeing Saul here prophesying. And so David, we see in these set of verses, 18 through 24, that David goes to Samuel, and he's probably seeking guidance from Samuel, not just spiritual guidance, right? I believe he's seeking spiritual guidance, what do I do, but he's also seeking um, practical protection. Hey, Samuel, hide me, you know? Samuel, help me, man. Dude is crazy. He's trying to kill me, right? And Samuel is probably was not a surprise to Samuel because remember, Samuel is the one who told uh, Saul, you know, back a few chapters ago that, hey, you're, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to have the kingdom no longer. And so remember, Samuel kind of had a, a little bit of a, you know, a reaction of fear as well from Saul. Saul. But you guys, listen, check this out. It's, it's important to seek, as we see David seeking guidance, right? I think it's extremely important for us to seek guidance in life, especially when we are being attacked. Especially when we're being attacked. Do you ever get attacked? Now, I, I'm not talking about, you know, attacked from your neighbor's dog, right? I'm, I'm talking about a spiritual attack, you ever get those spiritual attacks when you know that, man, you, you're just going in some warfare? You know, maybe you've heard that before, spiritual warfare. Maybe you, you just joined us these past several weeks and you're really kind of new to just Christianity, you know, uh, or maybe not. Maybe you've been with us for a long time. Maybe you've been a saved, you, you've been saved for, for a while and you say, yeah, I know exactly what spiritual warfare is. And, and that's a spiritual attack. You see, the devil, <laughs> he's always on the prowl. He never sleeps. You know, uh, you probably heard your grandmother say the same thing. The devil, the devil never sleeps, right? Um, but it's important, guys, to see, as we see here, David, he's seeking guidance and he's, you know, he's under attack, right? And he's going and he's asking questions. He's asking for protection probably and some guidance and letting him, letting him know what's going on. So this, we see here in this, in this narrative that Saul Okay, the king, he sends three waves of men, right? Messengers to go and really hunt down David and Samuel. Okay, three waves of men. That first wave, they kind of, they get there, boom, the spirit of the Lord comes upon them. They begin to prophesy. Okay, okay, okay they're, they're, the Lord got a hold of them. And Saul's like, well, send another group of messengers. Same thing. Send another group of messengers. Same thing, the spirit of the Lord came upon them, you see? And so these wave of men, they were sent by Saul, but they could not penetrate. Why? Because God was in control. You know, they couldn't get to David. And this wasn't because of David and his military expertise and because he was just outwitting them or anything. It, has nothing, it had nothing to do with David. This had everything to do with God. David had nothing to do with this. God was in control. God was, the spirit of the Lord says, the spirit of the Lord came upon them and they began to prophesy. So again, and not because of David, but all because of God. And God, not just the men, the messengers, but God also came upon Saul. God even stopped Saul himself, okay? Because Saul was like, you know what, forget it. I'm gonna go. These guys can't get it done. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna personally take out David. That was his motive. That was his, his heart behind it. Right? But God had a plan. Remember, there was that, that anointing of God. And as we're going to see in back uh, up in, uh, in chapter number 7 of 2 Samuel, okay? I believe it's 7, or 7 or 9, I forget which one. But we're going to see the, the, the covenant that God makes 
with David. And so there's a plan, there's a grand plan that God has for David, you see? And just in the same way, guys, that God has this grand plan for David, check it out, he's got a plan for you. He's got a plan for me in the same way. We may not sense it. We may not even understand it. You might be under attack right now, just like how David is under attack. Can you imagine if, if he was given a glimpse, say, hey, David, you know, uh, through your line, the Messiah is going to come through, your, through, through you. David would be like, dude, are you kidding me? This dude's trying to kill me. I might die tomorrow. I don't think anything's going to come out of me, right? right? So David, David wouldn't have comprehended it. But God was in control. God was watching over him. And guys, that's what I want to share. It's like God is in control of our lives. God knows our tomorrow. And you may be going through a spiritual battle right now. But I want to encourage you. Hey, listen, if that's what you're going through, go seek godly counsel. Seek godly guidance, right? Not just for protection, but for wisdom as well. Biblical wisdom searching the scriptures and, and being prayed with and prayed over. You see, God protected David from Saul and Saul's men from, from David, right? Really, this is, we see God all over this. So God is protecting David, but also God is protecting the men and, and protecting Saul from David defending himself because David would have defended himself and more people would have died. But we see again, God here in control. This shows us that God's actions how God does things. You know, sometimes we don't even understand it. I got, I don't know how, what you're doing. I don't know why this, but you know, it's not, it's not always only for one purpose. When God's, when God does something and his actions are in motion, they often have more than one effect and one purpose. You know, it's going to affect a person this way and another person that way. You see, just different things, multiple things. God, and that, we, don't you love that about God? You know, that it's just not only one thing at a time, but God can do one thing, but have multiple purposes that come out of it. You see, only Jesus can do that. Only our Lord, only our God can do that, right? And we see this kind of being transpired here. And then again, as I mentioned, the question there at the end, there at verse number 24, you know, it says, you know, is Saul one of the prophets? Again, this is more of, like, you know, they're being, they're bewildered because they understand of what Saul has been doing, you know, already. So this is, in chapter 10, it was more of a positive light, but here, not so much. Guys, here in chapter number 19, we see after David, or right, Saul's attempt to kill David, you know, just after him, attacking him, one after another, Right. And even the, the comments that he hears, you know, hey, you know, my dad wants to kill you. You know, it wasn't he didn't see it, but he heard about it. Right. We see this and these attacks. Right? It reminds me, reminds us of how the enemy, when I say the enemy, I'm talking about the devil, how the devil is out to kill you and me. The Bible is very clear when Jesus says in the gospel of John in chapter number 10, he, he says of the thief, he says the thief, speaking of the devil, he says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. There's nothing, none, you know, the devil's not like, you know what, I've been bothering Tommy for like a couple years now. I'm going to give him a break. I'm going to give him a month off. No, he don't do that. You know, the devil don't care. He's only out to do one thing, and that's to destroy people's lives. That's it. That's it. There's, there's nothing, there's no middle ground in that. And we see this kind of being illustrated in a way, and it reminds me of this spiritual kind of attack. Guys, we, you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, okay, we are under constant, a constant spiritual battle, and the enemy will exploit every situation to do evil and destroy like the enemy, he's going to want to, he'll exploit anything, any situation, any, any problem, any hiccup. He'll exploit it to get us, right, to respond to his spiritual attack, right? And when we, when we respond to the, the, the attack of the devil, guys, listen, when we respond in our flesh, you know, it, it, we're, we're falling right into his hands. The way that we're supposed to respond to any spiritual attack is, is to be biblical, it is to be honoring to the Lord. And guys, we need to guard our hearts from, from these things. We, we see this with, with Saul, right? 
we see how he's he, he the enemy you know uh, just is taking control of him right and we need to guard our hearts from jealousies from envy from pride because all these kinds of you know things here it, it produces hate it produces hate in a murderous heart right? That's what hate does. You know, as I was mentioning back in first John chapter four, you know, if we say that we hate Christians, you know, well then, you know, we're nothing but a liar. If we say that we hate our brother, I hate that person. I hate her. I don't like that. You know, look at her, look at her hair. I don't like her hair. You know, I don't know, whatever, you know? And it's just like, you're lying. The Bible says you're made out to be a liar because you're supposed to love one another, you're supposed to care for each other. And the same way that Saul was scheming and plotting even, okay, schemes and plots to do like evil schemes, the devil does the same thing. In Ephesians, in chapter number six, watch this, guys. In Ephesians, in chapter number six, write this down so you know it, okay? It says this, that what the devil does, he, the Bible tells us this, put on the whole armor of God. That's what Paul said, hey, put on the whole armor of God, right? We can talk about that later on, but everything, Put the whole armor of God on that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Some of your translations might say against the wiles of the devil. The wiles, and that's all really what the, that word wiles means is the schemes or, or the trickery, the plots. We need to put on the whole armor of God. We need to guard our hearts, guard our minds, because the devil, he doesn't sleep. He's out to get us, and we need the armor of God, not the armor of the world, but the armor of God, that we may be able to stand, withstand, and recognize the plots, the schemes, the lies the devil wants to destroy us with. See, the devil, man, he would love to destroy the church you know, one at a time. That says he just loved to do that. And let's guard our hearts from that. I'm so glad, guys, that we can know and trust. We can know and trust that Jesus and what he did on the cross, he destroyed the works of the devil there on the cross. In 1 John chapter 3, in verse number 8, towards the end of that verse, it says this, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The reason why Jesus appeared, the reason why he went to the cross to destroy the works of the devil. Praise the Lord, Jesus. Thank you, God. You did that for me because the devil's out to kill. But as we put our faith and our hope in him, that's why Jesus later on in the gospel of John chapter 10 and verse 10, he says that about the thief, still kill and destroy. Jesus says, but I have come. Jesus says of himself, I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. I love that. And this just reminds us again of what Jesus did on the cross, of how he took our sin and he willfully went to the cross, not just to destroy the works of the devil because he did do that. That's like check, done, right? But he did it to save us. He did it because... He wants to have a relationship with us. And it just this reminds me of what Jesus did and, and how we get to celebrate communion. And so right now, guys, I'm gonna pray right now as we close the time of Bible study, but we're gonna also have a time of praise and worship and we're gonna get into our communion time, okay? So let me pray. Father, God, I thank you for this time that we had to just be in your word, to journey through your word. And God, as we see the dangers, Lord, of letting, of not guarding our hearts from sin, from envy and jealousy and pride, all these different emotions that we all wrestle with, Lord. Some wrestle with these things more than others. But we know, Lord, that as we put our trust in you, that you as your word tells us, you, you, destroy, you destroyed the works of the devil. And God, some of these principles that what David did, Lord, he, he escaped. He escaped death. And he sought counsel. He cherished his friendships. Father, we pray that we would be reminded 
that because of the cross, we too have escaped death eternally because you love us. You love us more than a brother, Lord. And you're gracious to us.